Hello friends, welcome to MESS e-learning channel. So today is part 2 of the video on nanoscience and nanotechnology. In part 1 of the video, we have completed 3 topics and these 3 topics were, first were introduction to nanoscience and nanotechnology. The second topic was surface to volume ratio of the sphere and that of a cube and the third topic that we studied was the two main approaches that are used in making of nanomaterials. So today we are going to study the important tools that are used in the characterization of nanomaterials. These important tools are mainly divided into two types. First of all based on electron microscopy and second is nothing but those which are based on the atomic force microscopy. So we deal with the first category of this that is nothing but the electron microscopes. So now we characterize, we characterize or rather we categorize the different characterization techniques which are used for study of nanomaterials. So these are the tools and, their, and the way in which actually they are categorized. So as you can see that we have two categories to start with first of all electron microscope and nothing but the and the second one is nothing but the scanning probe microscopes. So under electron microscopes what we have is nothing but the scanning electron microscope and the second category is nothing but the transmission electron microscope. Under scanning probe microscopy, what we have is nothing but the atomic force microscopy and the second category which is there is nothing but the scanner, scanning tunneling microscopy. So here is a diagram or a figure that actually gives us the resolving power of the, to start with the resolving power of the eye the resolving power of a normal light microscope that we use and the resolving power of the electron microscope. So when you compare the values, you will actually come to know that the resolving power of the electron microscope is from 0.1 nanometer to around 1 angstroms. And this is the reason why the electron microscope is used for the study of nanomaterials. We now try to answer this particular question that why is it that the resolving power of the electron microscope is so low? So let us answer this particular question by taking the, by learning the mathematics behind it. So as you all know students that an electron is going to have a dual nature according to the de Broglie's wave principle. And therefore, the wavelength of an electron is given by the equation lambda is equal to h upon square root of 2 me, wherein in this particular equation h is nothing but the Planck's constant, m is nothing but the electron mass and e is nothing but the kinetic energy that has been acquired by the electrons when they are accelerated through a particular potential. So when you know all these three values, the first two values of course are constants and the last value is a variable which depends upon the amount of potential that you are applying. Now when we know all these three values, you can actually calculate lambda of an electron. This means lambda is nothing but the de Broglie wavelength of an electron. Now let us put in the values for the, in this particular equation and let us try to find out what is the, what is the value that lambda gains. So here is an example wherein we are having a very typical electron microscope wherein it is accelerated to, wherein the electrons are actually accelerated through 1000 volts and their energy is actually turning out to be 1000 electron volts as we know that. And when we substitute all these values in the equation that, we, that was there in the previous slide namely lambda is equal to h upon square root of 2 me you get the value of lambda to be as small as 0 0.03 nanometers. Now 
0 0.03 nanometers, you will immediately say that that is the reason why the electron microscopes are used in the study of nanomaterials. But there is one more reason. Why is it that it scores more above the optical microscope? Let us see that in the next slide. So, we will see that for an electron microscope as you have right now calculated this value, when the electrons are accelerated through 1000 volts, the de Broglie wavelength of the electrons is around 0 0.03 nanometers. Compare that with the, with the wavelength of the photons and what is the wavelength of the photons? Normally for, for the average wavelength of a photon, for, for the yellow, for the yellow photon, for the yellow color photon, it is around 5500 angstroms, which is of course 550 nanometers. Now compare 550 nanometers with 0 0.03 nanometers. So since the de Broglie wavelength of an electron accelerated through 1000 volts is less in comparison, in le not only less but by a few order of magnitudes it is less in comparison to the wavelength of a light photon, the resolving power is actually inverse of this. Hence, the resolving power of an optical microscope is much lower than the resolving power of an electron microscope. And this is the key principle that rules the functioning of an electron microscope. And this was actually noticed by the previous scientist and that is the reason why work started on an instrument which will actually work on using electrons. So, instead of focusing light, why not focus electrons? And this actually gave birth to the electron microscopes. The first microscope which will be learning is nothing but the scanning electron microscope. So, we have seen that the resolving power of the electron microscope is much, much higher than the resolving power of an uh, optical microscope. And that is the reason why we actually use an uh, electron microscope to study the features of a nanomaterial. So, let us study the first category of the electron microscope and that is nothing but the scanning electron microscope. So, what do you mean by scanning electron microscopy? Basically, scanning electron microscopy is nothing but the inspection of the magnified surfaces or rather the topography of magnified surfaces, in this case the topography of nanomaterials at very high resolution using an instrument which is called as the scanning electron microscope. Now, over here what you see is nothing but a cross section of a scanning electron microscope and it is nothing but a schematic diagram of a scanning electron microscope. What it comprises of is nothing but basically of a very long tube and inside this tube and this tube of course, we have to be careful and you have to specify this particular fact that this tube is under high vacuum because since we are dealing with electrons, if we do not have vacuum inside this, the electrons which are being used for the analysis will easily undergo interaction with the atmospheric atoms and they will lose their energy and our purpose will not be solved. So, what we have over here is nothing but a long tube under very high vacuum, maybe high means of the order of around 10 raise to minus 6 tor to around 10 raise to minus 9 tor. To start with, what we have is nothing but the electron source over here that is placed right at the top. You have electron, this is basically a, nothing but a, a heated filament and you have this electrons flowing coming out of this, coming out of this filament and they are given, they are actually been given a particular direction using the first condenser lens over here. Then this is basically the second condenser lens over here and lastly there is an objective lens. So, while passing through all this ultimately this of very high focused and unidirectional beam of electrons falls on your sample which is to be analyzed. And remember we are actually it is it does not pass through the sample, but rather it falls on the sample. Here we have the sample. Before learning the working of the further working of how is it that we extrapolate this the, the main signal 
from uh, for the scanning electron microscope let us study what exactly happens when this highly unidirectional beam of electrons falls on your sample on your nanomaterial sample so let's see what happens so this is your this is your beam and this is your interacting volume of the sample so there is there are x rays that are being emitted not only x rays but there are also secondary electrons that are being emitted and not only that but these are the back scattered electrons which is there and not only that but also in addition you are going to have even light and all the signals can be analyzed and all of the signals will actually give us the basic information about the characteristic of the nanomaterial surface so for example the the x rays will actually be able to give you the composition of the material of the of which this this particular nanomaterial is formed not only that but light will also give us an idea about the band gap of this particular material so the next step is let us see how we obtain the image of nanomaterials using a scanning electron microscope so basically here are the here are the steps in which an image is formed in a scanning electron microscope of the surface that we want to study so first what we have is nothing but a beam of electrons which is focused on a very small volume on a very spot volume of the nano material and what this means of the specimen and this results in the transfer of energy of the electrons to the nano material surface the next step is nothing but due to due to this transfer of energy there are some dislodged electrons from the nano material itself and this dislodged electrons are nothing but they are called as the secondary electrons so the beam one can say is comprising of the primary electrons whereas the dislodged electrons are nothing but they are called as the secondary electrons and these are the secondary electrons which we need to analyze which contain the signal so what happens is the minute it actually dislodges the secondary signals which are being produced they are actually the uh, they are actually caught with the help of a grid which is also called as a detector now this grid which is there is nothing but it is positively charged and that's the reason why it is able to collect this particular signal now what happens is the spot of this electron is very small that is around around 5 nanometers or so now this signal which we have captured using the detector is only at one particular spot so basically what you have to do is you uh, you will actually have to scan this entire sample using the small beam and collect signals and each and every spot and it is this collective signal which is basically it is amplified then it is analyzed and then transferred into a a collective signal of that particular spot the collective spot which you have actually studied the final image results due to due to the ensemble of all such data that we have collected from such small spots and the final image can actually be obtained either on a photographic plate or it can be obtained digitally on a ccd camera so in next we actually study or rather we have a look at a particular sem image that has been taken using a scanning electron microscope this is an image of a mic of a of a mesosporic material mesospores are approximately in the pores are approximately in the nano range a few from ranging from around 50 nanometers to around 100 nanometers and all these pores are actually doped with zinc oxide so you can see the image of a mesosporous material dip, uh, doped with zinc oxide nano rods the second in the list of electron microscopes is nothing but the transmission electron microscopes before dealing with the transmission electron microscope let us study some kind of analogy between transmission electron microscope and a and a slide projector which we have seen so here is the analogy in a slide projector what we have is nothing but a bulb the light source whereas in a transmission electron microscope what we have is nothing but a electron source 
a heated electron source that releases electron. In a slide projector, this is followed by this is followed by the the condenser lens. In the same way, over here too, we are having the condenser lens. This means in the transmission electron microscope. But we have to be careful over here. These lenses are made out of glass, whereas these lenses over here they are electromagnetic lenses. Next, we have nothing but the, the transparent slide through which the light will pass. Over here, what we have is nothing but a thin sample of the nanomaterial through which the electrons will pass. Once again, drawing an analogy, what we have over here is nothing but the objective lens and over here in the case of a TEM, once again you have an objective lens, but this lens of course, as I am repeating it, it is nothing, it is not a, it is not a lens that is made out of glass, but it is an electromagnetic lens. Finally, light passes through this, passes, light passes through this slide and an enlarged image of this is there on a projector screen which is kept at quite a distance over here. The same principle is being used over here and the enlarged image of the of the specimen of the specimen over here is formed on uh, either on a photographic plate or on a CCD surface. So, this is it. Having seen the analogy between a transmission electron microscope and that between a slide projector, it will make us understand transmission electron microscope in a better way. So, one can see if we can compare this with the scanning electron microscope. So, scanning electron microscope gives us information only about the topographical features of a particular nanomaterial. On the contrary, in the transmission electron microscope as you will see in the next slide, the electrons actually pass through the or rather transmitted, hence the name transmission electron microscope, they are transmitted through the samples. So, we can have some kind of idea regarding the bulk properties of the nanomaterials under study. So, a transmission electron microscope is basically a category of electron microscope and hence it also requires a very high vacuum for reasons which I have already stated while doing scanning electron microscope. So, this consists of a very, very long tube over here and in this particular tube is there is an alignment of the following apparatus. So, what are these or what are the different kind of components which are there? These are nothing but the illumination system which comprises of the electron gun out over here. So, what we have is nothing but the electron gun which we also have the condenser lens and this particular condenser lens is nothing but it is this particular lens, it is nothing but the condenser lens. Once again emphasizing the fact that these lenses are electromagnetic in nature. This is followed by the sample, the sample is being placed over here and immediately after that we have the image forming system which comprise, comprises of the objective lens. Once again we have an intermediate lens over here. Finally, we have the projector lens and the entire image and enlarged image of the sample is projected on this particular either on a photographic plate or on a CCD surface. We have studied the various components which are included in a transmission electron microscope. The next stage is let us now see how these various components work in tandem in order to produce a TEM image. So, basically in a transmission electron microscope what we have is nothing but a electron source and this electron source releases electrons and this electrons actually pass through the condenser, a set of condenser lenses and ultimately they fall on the thin sample. Due to this, 
the sample gets irradiated with a uniform electron density. Now, this electrons will actually catch the signal from the catch information from the from the sample and they will they are transmitted and that's the reason why we say that it is a transmission electron microscope this transmitted electrons are then focused either to give you a magnified image of the interior of the bulk sample or to give you uh, give you a diffraction or a, give you a very diffracted image so the diffraction pattern helps us to understand the crystal structure of the of the particular nanomaterial under study so suppose we are getting a, a very unique crystal structure suppose it is suppose if the the sample under study is actually a crystalline is actually crystalline in nature then it will give us a very beautiful diffraction pattern uh, you know the the loy points but if at all it is amorphous it will not give you a crystalline it will not give you a, a, a diffracted image because that in itself is not crystalline so you can know you can immediately tell whether the whether the material under study whether it is crystalline or whether it is amorphous so this is one more one more way in which actually you can use the transmission electron microscope image now coming coming back to the uh, to the objective uh, to the objective lenses the information or rather the electrons after passing through the objective lenses are ultimately they are passed through the projector lens and this projector lens creates a enlarged image of the of the sample under study and this image as i've told you previously it can either be a diffracted image or it can also be a enlarged image of the of the bulk of the particular uh, sample and this information of course can be taken the enlarged image can be taken either on a photographic plate or it can also be taken on a ccd camera so next what we have is nothing but an image of an actual image that is taken using a transmission electron microscope you can immediately see once again this is an example of mesophorous materials you can see the order in the mesophorous material right and the scale bar over here is of around 50 nanometer so you see that transmission electron microscope indeed gives you the bulk information of this material right at the nano scale and you can immediately see that the order is actually persisting not only on the surface but rather at the interiors also so this is the way that we have a transmission electron microscope functions and thus it is used to give us information not only about the surface but also the bulk properties of nano materials so here is a quick recap of what we have learned in this particular video so in the first part we have learned regarding the important tools in nanotechnology and the first first instrument that we learned was the scanning electron microscope the second tool or the instrument that we learned about was nothing but the transmission electron microscope to compare scanning electron microscope gives us information about the enlarged topography of the nano material whereas the transmission electron microscope gives us not only about the topography information not only about the topography but also regarding the bulk characteristics of the nano materials it actually tells us whether the particular material is in a crystalline form or whether it is an amorphous amorphous form in the first video we have covered these three topics so in the forthcoming video we will actually be covering once again the tools of nanotechnology but this will be more based on the scanning probe microscopy and these are nothing but the atomic force micro microscope and the second one that is nothing but the scanning tunneling microscope thank you for watching this particular video i hope you have understood this particular topics